Welcome back. Now we're going to start having some fun. Um, and we're going to kick things off with a really esteemed uh, group of panelists this morning. I'm going to introduce them both all just very briefly. Their full bios are in your program, two minute warning, uh, because we do want to allow plenty of time for Q&A at the end, which has been uh, budgeted into our agenda. So first up on uh, this panel, uh, we have our moderator, Jerry Goldstein, to my left. He's a professor here at Roger Williams School of Law. Uh, he's worked in the past as an associate at Sherman and Sterling in Washington, D.C. He's done a lot of work on behalf of Guantanamo detainees. Uh, also served as an attorney for the Department of Justice uh, in the appellate section of the Environmental and Natural Resources Division. Uh, he teaches constitutional law and environmental law and, most importantly, marine law topics here at the law school. Uh, and in, even more important, he's a valuable member of my advisory board. Next, uh, to his left, we have Eldon uh, Greenberg, senior counsel at Garvey Schubert Bear, former general counsel at NOAA, uh, and has an extensive practice on behalf of natural resource clients specializing in fisheries matters. Next to him, Peter Shelley, uh, the Vice President and Director of the Conservation Law Foundation's Massachusetts Advocacy Center. Uh, before his time there, he served for five years as Assistant Attorney General for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Resources. Uh, he has his bachelor's from Hobart College and his JD from Suffolk University School of Law. Next to him, Gene Martin from uh, the Office of NOAA's General Counsel. Uh, he's been an attorney there for over 23 years and legal counsel to the New England Fishery Management Council and the Sustainable Fisheries Division of NIMS in the Northeast region um, regarding fisheries and issues that come up under the Magnuson Stevens Act. I usually see Gene at Fisheries Management Council sitting up there going, oh no, no. So it's nice to be able to offer him an opportunity, actually all of us who uh, follow fisheries in any way, an opportunity to be in a setting like this rather than a council meeting. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little different here. Uh, Gene has uh, uh, his Juris Doctor from Brigham Young University Law School and his Master's in Marine Policy from the University of Delaware. Next to him, Josh Eagle, uh, Associate Professor of Law at the University of South Carolina School of Law, where he teaches property, environmental, and natural resources law, including fishery management and endangered species. Currently, he's focusing on, guess what, ocean zoning, marine protected areas, and improving public participation and resource decision making, all very important issues. Uh, prior to joining the faculty at South Carolina in 2004, he was the director of the Stanford Fisheries Policy Project. Um, he also has experience as a trial attorney for the United States Department of Justice in D.C., uh, also in the policy office of the National Audubon Society, uh, graduated from John Hopkins University with his bachelor's degree, Colorado State University with a master's in forest sciences and Georgetown University Law Center. And over to his left, uh, batting cleanup, Mike Conathan, uh, who's a staffer for the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and Coast Guards. Your titles are just way too long in Congress. Can you work on that this next session? Uh, as you heard, uh, Mike has uh, done a lot of work with Senator Olympia Snow, uh, the subcommittee's ranking member, and the full committee's ranking member, Kay Bailey Hutchison. Uh, he's been there. Uh, for nearly five years, uh, serving first as a, a Knauss Fellow, yes, it says Sea Grant Fellow in our, our program, but Knauss Fellow, and a lot of our students and alumni know what that means, in 2006, and has been with them full-time since February 2007. Knauss Fellowships turn into really cool jobs, current students, so keep that in mind. Uh, before that, uh, Mike got his Master's in Marine Affairs from, guess where, the University of Rhode Island. So we're happy to bring Mike in a, uh, back up here. He has his bachelor's in English literature from Georgetown University, uh, is also an alum of the Williams College Mystic Seaport Maritime Studies program, and uh, grew up in Cape Cod. So I'm going to turn it over to Eldon Greenberg first, and uh, away we go. And we're done. <laughs> That's the history of the <laughs> <laughs> It ebbs, it flows. All right, where's the lights? That's what I want. And I want the image back. Excellent. Right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, to talk about the 
evolution of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. It, it was a little daunting as I was preparing for my presentation this morning to realize that I was actually around when the Magnuson-Stevens Act was enacted in 1976 and have lived through uh, all the amendments since. Uh, but I'll try not to tell too many boring war stories about the history of the act and in, instead focus on substance. Uh, over the past 35 years, uh, the Magnuson-Stevens Act has been amended on numerous occasions. I like to say that uh, it demonstrates that members of, of Congress are optimists. Uh, you know, it's the triumph of hope over experience that you can actually get things better uh, each time you try to fiddle with the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And, and it's apparent from all the amendments that we, we've never achieved uh, a true optimum setting for this act, despite the fact that national standard number one calls for the achievement of optimum yield. Uh, the evolution of the Act has comprised five distinct stages that I'm going to talk about this morning. The first period, 1974 to 1976, that's the heroic era. I'll talk about that. Uh, then in 1978 and 1980, there was a focus on Americanizing uh, U.S. fisheries and promoting the development of fisheries, particularly in Alaska and New England. The decade of the 80s was a decade of consolidation and what I call tinkering at the edges. In 1990, there were a comprehensive set of amendments uh, which really related back to what was going on in 1974 and 1976, a reconsideration of American fisheries management in the context of global fisheries management. And then finally, the most recent era, the amendments in 19. Uh, 96 and 2007, which uh, I roughly characterize as representing the rise of environmentalism in fishery management. The trajectory of the act has been from relative simplicity. I, if you take the act as enacted in 1976, it was about 30 pages long. It was relatively manageable. You could get through it uh, in a relatively short read. Uh, as I counted up the pages in my Magnus and Stevens Act book uh, from 2007, the act is now 170 pages long. It's gotten enormously complex, and that, of course, is daunting for all of us who practice in the area. And the most important element of the trajectory that, that I see is really uh, an evolution from a focus particularly on promotion of the U.S. fisheries in the early years of the act uh, to uh, an increasing attention to the need to conserve the fishery resource. And that's marked particularly by the amendments in 1996 and 2007. So let me turn first to the heroic era. Uh, you know, many of us regard the Magnus and Stevens Act today as an environmental statute. About protecting and conserving the fishery resources under U.S. jurisdiction. But I, I think it's fair to say that that was not the focus of the act in 1976. Uh, in 1976, what concerned Congress primarily was the jurisdictional issue. Uh, whether a 200-mile fishery conservation zone, which we now call the exclusive economic zone, was justified under international law. And if you pull out the history of the act, and I, I see that we've got that thick orange volume sitting in front of Gene Martin, that's the 1976 legislative history, which I recognized. Uh, <laughs> you'll see that the debate was about whether or not it was proper under international law for the United States to uh, assert jurisdiction over resources within 200 miles of our coast. And the primary goal of the legislation in that era was what I refer to as uh, kicking the foreigners out. Uh, and that came especially from the fishing industry here in New England and from the fishing industry uh, in Alaska. Fierce opposition to the legislation from the Defense and State Departments, 
and from many elements of the U.S. fishing industry, such as the tuna f fishermen who were exempted originally from jurisdiction of the Act in 1976, and the shrimp fishermen who ultimately lost uh, their productive fishing grounds in the Caribbean as a result of the extension of 200-mile fishery jurisdiction zones throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, domestic management during that debate was uh, something of an afterthought. I talked to my brother-in-law, Bud Walsh, who worked for the Senate Commerce Committee at the time, and I asked him about this, and he said, well, you know, we just had to put in something on domestic management because the non-coastal senators and representatives felt there had to be some quid pro quo for asserting jurisdiction over the fishery resources. Uh, Jacob Dykstra, who hailed from Point Judith, Rhode Island, not far from here, who was one of the major proponents of the act, was shocked when Bud Wall said, well, we're going to have to have some management measures put in place uh, to govern U.S. fisheries. Jake didn't think that the Magnuson-Stevens Act, or it was then called the Fishery Conservation and Management Act, should have much to do with management. It was basically about just allowing the U.S. to exploit the resource uh, without having to deal with those pesky uh, Eastern Europeans uh, and Russians who were uh, vacuuming the fisheries off our shores. Still, it's fair to say that the council system uh, that was set up in 1976 and which is still the system that we have is a major regulatory innovation. And the system of national standards, regionally applied, uh, which is the system that we still have today, uh, was devised at that time. I talked to Bud a little bit about the national standards. Bud told me that he wrote the national standards on the back of an envelope over the weekend during the debate. We then had seven national standards. Uh, they've actually held up pretty well, but it's also probably fair to say that because they were written quickly uh, and because they were meant to appeal to a number of different constituencies, they represent something of a hodgepodge, and they certainly are not internally consistent. And sometimes it's hard to tell what the priority should be for management under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. More about that later. Uh, the environmental community played almost no role in 1976 except for seeking an extension to 200 miles of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And uh, I think most people saw the act in 1976 as an act that was about promotion of domestic fisheries in the United States. In fact, if you read one of the very first cases decided under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, a case called Maine versus Kreps, decided by the First Circuit in 1977, uh, what the court says is, well, the first priority of this act is food production. That's what it's about. Uh, at that time, I was uh, in the private sector representing environmental organizations. I hate to admit that to my fishery clients today. And I, I wrote a letter to Elliot Richardson, who was then Secretary of Commerce. It was my one uh, action under the Magnuson Steams Act at the time. And I said to Secretary Richardson, you really ought to consider appointing representatives of environmental organizations to fishery management councils as you get this new system underway. Uh, I never got a response to that letter, and I, I suspect it generated a lot of giggles in the Department of Commerce at the time because uh, I don't think anybody thought that in, uh, environmental organizations had much of a role to play in fishery management. Well, the next era, as I call it, was the era of achieving Americanization. These were amendments to the Act in 1978 and 1980. And there was a recognition during this period that the mere assertion of jurisdiction was not enough to Americanize the fisheries. More needed to be done. So the first amendment in 1978, which was called the Processor Preference Amendment, amendment <laughs> responded to the emerging phenomenon of joint ventures. These were ventures under which American fishermen would go out and fish, but there were no onshore processors to process the fish. So they would enter into agreements with foreign floating fish processing operations from Japan or the Soviet Union or from Poland. And the fish would be processed at sea by these foreign operations. In 1978, the effort of Congress was to establish a priority 
for U.S. fish processors over foreign fish processors to help Americanize not only the harvesting sector of the fisheries, but also the processing sector. And then the second significant amendment was in 1980. This was called the American Fisheries Promotion Act. I think the title says it all. Uh, that's, that's what Congress was concerned with in 1980, promoting U.S. fisheries. And in that set of amendments to the act, we institutionalized what was called the fish and chips policy. That was a policy under which allocations to foreign countries of the right to harvest in the U.S. FCZ were dependent upon those foreign countries opening up their markets to U.S. fish products. The countries didn't open up their markets, reduce tariff and non-tariff barriers. They got lower allocations. When you look at that statute, you also see a lot of measures that are really dead letters today focused on development of the fisheries. A great deal of attention paid to research and development grants under what was called the Salt and Stall Kennedy Act to promote U.S. fisheries. <clears throat> Uh, revisions to our fishing vessel obligation guarantee program, which financed the building of, fishery, uh, of fishing vessels. You know, if you say today, what were we doing back then? Well, we were trying to get the fishery going, particularly in New England and also in Alaska, uh, and get it going in ways that it had not been able to when it had been suffering uh, under the yoke of uh, substantial foreign fishing operations in the U.S. EEZ. The next set of changes really took up what I would call the whole decade of the 1980s. There were major amendments in 1983 and 1986, and both of those sets of amendments grew out of a comprehensive oversight report prepared by the House Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee, a committee which no longer exists, by the way. Um, and these, these were the first set of amendments that were really focused on the structure of regulation. We now had five, six, seven years of experience in managing the fisheries. Uh, and the goal of Congress in 1983 and 1986 was to take a look at the management institutions that we had and see how they were working. Were they effective? Were they achieving the goals which Congress had? Uh, do they need to be improved in some ways? So there was an overhaul of management institutions, uh, the modification of the process for developing and implementing management measures, great deal of attention to strengthening the enforcement powers of the federal government, which were relatively limited under the statute as it was enacted in 1976. Uh, and None of these amendments had what I would characterize as an overarching theme to them. Uh, they really were literally tinkering at the edges, deciding whether the Federal Advisory Committee Act should or should not apply to regional fishery management councils, looking to see whether uh, there should be subpoena power in NOAA administrative enforcement hearings and the like. Uh, the one significant change I would mention, and this wasn't a change to the Magnuson-Stevens Act itself, was in 1976, in 1986, excuse me, where the amendments also included the Interjurisdictional <laughs> Fisheries Act. And that was a recognition by Congress 10 years after enactment of the statute that we needed to focus as well upon the management of coastal migratory species which were within the jurisdiction of the states and particularly within the jurisdiction of the three state interstate fishery commissions which had been established many years earlier by interstate compact. The 1986 amendments were intended to strengthen the management mechanisms that we had in place for these interjurisdictional fisheries so that we could manage fishery resources such as striped bass which were not generally found within the EEZ and were found within the jurisdictions of several coastal states. Okay. The uh, fourth phase, I would call rediscovering internationalism. These were 1990 amendments. And this was a return to the international focus that dominated the mid-1970s debate. There was a growing recognition that even with the Americanization of EEZ fisheries, effective management and conservation inevitably has an international component. 
So there was a focus on management of Pollock in the area outside of national jurisdiction in the Bering Sea, on the dangers of high seas drift gill net fisheries, and on the need for the United States to assert jurisdiction over tuna, but to do so in the context of international management measures. And finally, I come to the stage of amendments in 1996 and 2007, which I would characterize as the discovery by the environmental community of fishery management. The Sustainable Fisheries Act of 1996 grew out of several phenomena, one of which was the publication by NIMS of a report called Our Living Oceans in the early 1990s, documenting overutilization of the resources. One was the crisis in New England fishery management. And one, which was either related or uh, the result of these crises, was the formation of something called the Marine Fish Conservation Network, a coalition of environmental organizations whose objective was to reform the Magnuson-Stevens Act to ensure a greater conservation focus. And if you look at the 1996 and 2007 amendments, what you see is that that focus becoming increasingly dominant. Uh, focus of the 1996 amendments, eliminating overfishing, rebuilding depleted fish stocks, adopting a precautionary approach to management, minimizing bycatch, protecting marine habitats through the establishment of what's called essential fish habitat. And I think basically that the 2007 amendments continued many of the same themes, ending overfishing, establishing firm deadlines for rebuilding, reducing bycatch, enhancing the role of science in fishery management decisions. And we're struggling with those issues now in the context of litigation over management of the New England groundfish fishery. Uh, we're also struggling with the other major development in 2007, which was the institution of a regime for cat shares in U.S. fisheries. So for the first time in, 19, in 2007, the Magnuson-Stevens Act incorporated a complex series of provisions, uh, providing mechanisms for establishing and implementing cat share programs. And I think in the Amendment 16 litigation that is uh, pending in district court in Boston, we're going to see the first judicial interpretation of just how that cat share regime should or should not operate. I'll conclude simply by saying that I don't think a major overhaul is on the horizon at this point. I think there may be a reaction to what I characterize as the regime's tilt against efficiency in 1996 and 2007. And some are questioning whether the system of management that we have in place is becoming too rigid. We need to go back to a more flexible system. Uh, and we see this again in the controversy over Amendment 16 here in New England, with many arguing that Amendment 16, which is the cat shares program in New England, uh, results in, in the dissatisfaction with the operation of, uh, of, of that management measure, results from a system which is not flexible enough and is unable to take into account in an adequate way the needs of the fishermen and the needs of their community. So once again, if we see changes uh, in the immediate future, I think you'll see New England uh, playing a critical force in driving amendments to the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Peter Shelley from Conservation Law Foundation, and uh, thank you, Susan and uh, um, Jared, for inviting me to participate in the steering committee and this conference. Um, let me get this clicker going here. Um, actually, um, I think um, that Eldon's uh, history was pretty good and pretty accurate. CLF may have been the first conservation group to use the, um, uh, the Fishery Conservation and Management Act, which we did. 
1978, but we used it to block oil and gas drilling in a NEPA case. Um, we didn't get to fishery conservation um, as a prime focus uh, of our litigation until 1989, and, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the history of fishery management through the lens of one very big, very important, and very complex fishery, the New England groundfish fishery. Um, and again, for those of you who don't know the phrase groundfish, it applies to the complex of cod, haddock, flounders, other bottom-dwelling fish that have, has been the mainstay of the New England fishery for over 400 years, and I think this, this will give you some sense of the law as applied uh, and uh, its evolution. I also have um, made the mistake of including slides with way too many words, so I'm not going to read these. Uh, hopefully the speed readers will be able to keep up with me um, uh, as I go through this. Um, this is where we work. This slide has significance, I think, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it shows the interconnection between the marine world and the land. Um, we're talking about fishery management, but the health of the world in which fish uh, live and um, thrive is uh, increasingly affected by um, sources from land. Um, Senator Whitehouse talked about um, uh, airborne uh, pollutants. Um, there are also uh, clearly uh, waterborne pollutants that uh, affect the health of fisheries inshore. We're not talking about that part of the equation of a healthy fishery, but it's very much uh, important to take into account. The second thing is that uh, the land, and this has to do with some of the climate change impacts, has always been important to fishing. Uh, in the old days in Gloucester with the captain's log books, they used to record rainfall in the spring because the rainfall coming out of the rivers into the Gulf of Maine had a big impact on where fish would aggregate. And uh, so the, the, the good boat captains knew that after a wet or a dry spring, you went to one bank at a particular time, and that's where the fish would be coming up. So uh, the interconnections between uh, land and water are very important. The second thing about this slide that's important is New England has two natural resources bases. One is the forests and one is the oceans. The forests are privately owned predominantly and the oceans are publicly owned. So those two uh, resources and the economies that develop from them give us a really interesting opportunity to look at private uh, resource management versus public resource management. And you can't talk about public resource management without, without the tragedy of the commons. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out in the definition is to really, uh, how important it is to grasp the tragedy uh, associated with this commons. Uh, most conservation groups think about the tragedy in terms of the impacts on the resource, the ruin that uh, Professor Hardin talked about here. But I think the most uh, critical piece of it, and the one that makes it such a political context, um, is that uh, the element that people in this uh, commons paradigm, um, we're not talking about people pursuing evil. We're talking about people who are acting rationally, who are pursuing their best interest, and still uh, the world crashes down on them. So it is, um, uh, it's very much a tragedy, and I, I uh, encourage people to study um, the uh, common property literature uh, in order to help. The second thing is the prescription that Hardin uh, dished out basically amounts to the fishery management plot process, uh, which is mutual coercion. Uh, coercion was a critical element about that. The other part was mutually agreed upon. Uh, the council process, I think, is still an experiment in shared resource management that uh, we'll hear about some more uh, from other speakers. And then, again, this is, this just is some of the histories of uh, common property management. These are halibut that are being uh, offloaded at the Boston Pier probably around the turn of the century. Um, those big fellows are all gone now. The fishery is still in the tanks from uh, over-harvesting that occurred many, many decades ago. Um, I've structured this based on two prior law review articles um, I participated in. Hopefully I'll write a third if we get around to it. I'm memorializing this, but uh, some of these observations I'm about to make uh, come from those law review articles, so they were more or less contemporary observations, um, and it's uh, sort of interesting to uh, think back on it. 
Um, and again, I'm not going to read everything, so you should, you should scan down this. But uh, our first litigation was in 1991. We got involved in fishery conservation actually as the basis of calls from fishermen. Um, ironically, Gloucester fishermen uh, who were calling us saying that the management system was broken. This was in 1990. Um, and that they were worried about the direction of the fishery and that CLF should get involved. They probably would, if they could back up the tape, they may, uh, may have revised some of those calls and never made them. But um, in the first litigation, what we really focused on was the uh, damage associated with the flexibility that was in the law right then, at that point in time. And the importance of having objective, measurable definitions of what overfishing was, uh, to have mandatory um, rebuilding requirements uh, with particularly quantified um, biomass goals and time limits uh, for achieving those goals. Um, I think the other thing that really came out to us at that point in time, and it's been alluded to, was the, the impossibility of actually making rational management decisions given the national standards as they were at that time, where everything was uh, attempted to be optimized at the same time, including the most troublesome goal, which was National Standard 1, which required you to both um, drive economic development as hard as possible, that's the optimum yield side of it, and at the same time prevent overfishing, which is the conservation side of it. And uh, uh, there were seven other national standards that, at least in terms of the text of the legislation, all seem to have equal weight. Um, and as a result, councils uh, inevitably got distracted into looking at so many things they couldn't do any one of them right, at least as far as we were concerned. The other point, uh, the other observation that we um, made at that time was this phenomenon that fisheries tend to overcapitalize. Uh, by the time management occurs, a fishery is fully built out, investments have already been made, and all the incentives at that point are to protect the investments. And, uh, um, but management, on the other hand, tends to be undercapitalized, and I think um, that's still uh, a situation we're dealing with. Um, we were next back in court um, in, um, uh, with Amendment 9 of the Ground Fish Fishery Management Plan. Um, as Eldon mentioned, uh, the Sustainable Fisheries Act was passed in part to respond to some of the um, structural issues that emerged in uh, the New England litigation that happened in the early 90s. Um, and again, uh, in that case, the judge agreed with the plaintiffs on all counts. Um, and uh, although the liability ruling uh, happened in 2001, the order didn't come out until 2002. And by that time, Amendment 13 was already well underway by the council. Um, amendment 13 was the next significant amendment. Um, and it, it did finally take uh, New England in some new directions. Uh, Pretty, pretty uh, uh, important science-based biomass recommendations were adopted despite a fair amount of skepticism and hesitation on the part of the council. Um, the, uh, because of the amendments, the uh, uh, measures that uh, were adopted to prevent overfishing, although they used a mechanism called phased um, rebuilding for some fisheries, which actually sanctioned overfishing in the early days and then magically was hoping for either some reproduction bonanza or some other phenomenon to allow the fishery to catch up and get back up to this uh, rebuilt biomass. Um, it also saw the first piloting of sector management, which uh, we'll talk about a lot in this conference. Um, very weak protection of habitat. Uh, habitat started to come into the uh, statutory framework in uh, the 96 amendments. Um, and then bycatch, which is the catch of untargeted species, uh, was still weak in Amendment 13. Uh, a couple of lessons we learned uh, during this amendment process. Uh, there's the first discussion that fishery management really needed to be done mindful of other uh, ocean ecosystem issues. Uh, there was a clear sense that the science had to be further insulated from the political process and sausage making that the councils are uh, charged with doing. 
and that there had to be some accountability. Uh, we still had overfishing going on in a number of, with a number of stocks even eight years after uh, the 96 amendments. I think that's what, let me, these are, these are a little bit hard to see, uh, but this is where we were uh, in uh, 2007. The, I can't even see them. <laughs> the dotted line um, was the, is the uh, biomass uh, target. Um, so a lot of the fisheries, even as of 2007, were well below um, the targets for uh, biomass that were set by the science. And uh, as of 2007, this is the fishing rate, uh, which is the rate at which fish are being removed from the ocean. And um, the fishing rates as of 2007 um, were still uh, much higher than the dotted line here, which represents the goal of fishery management to get the, f the uh, fishing rates down to that level. 2007, um, the, the objective uh, for the council, for the managers here, is to get in that lower right box. Um, that's the, um, I guess you could call it some sort of a sweet spot for fisheries management where the stocks are neither overfished, that is they're above the uh, biomass objective, and overfishing isn't occurring, that is the, f the rate of harvesting is below the level that the scientists say is sustainable. So by 2007, although if we looked at this comparing it to 10 years before, uh, the, the fisheries are getting closer to inching toward that uh, bottom right sector. Uh, still most of the fisheries in New England in the groundfish fishery were in the overfished, overfishing category. Um, again, 2007, this is showing the, what's happening with the stocks, what's happening to the fish as of 2007. Uh, the curve is heading in the right direction, but without looking at, you can't see the specific species, but um, uh, a large amount of the biomass that actually did rebuild is attributable to two uh, species or two stocks. Uh, one, the haddock, a haddock stock, and the other, a redfish stock. So in terms of the complex, there was not um, equivalent rebuilding across all the stocks. And uh, that has ended up becoming quite a management challenge uh, in later years. Two minutes, OK. Um, Groundfish revenues over this period of time, the landings went down, uh, but because of prices, um, actually the rev groundfish landings revenues were fairly stable. Um, another thing I wanted to point out was as of uh, 2007, this, these uh, charts show um, how the different ports or the areas within the region were faring. And you can see there's some up and down in New Bedford and Gloucester. Uh, Gloucester went up um, toward the end of the time series. Other places like Portland, Maine went down. A lot of the other um, ports uh, stayed relatively stable. Um, another thing to look at, at least in 2007, uh, you hear a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of questions about, are the big boats winning out? Are the small boats winning out? Who's winning this fishery lottery? And uh, you know, it, it stayed surprisingly um, even across the uh, boat lengths over this period of time, at least as far as uh, it surprised me. And then 2007, who's catching the fish? And this is what is, I call the 80-20 rule, and it, it holds fast pretty well in a lot of fisheries. Um, but what you see here is that a few boat, 10% uh, of the active boats, which I think is about uh, 82 vessels, um, in 2007 we're catching almost 60 percent of the fish. So when you talk about the New England fishery, you're talking about a very economically heterogeneous uh, group of fishing operations, ones from very small part-time operations to very uh, large-scale uh, concentrated operations. Amendment 16, um, the one that's in litigation right now, over 50,000 pages in the record, um, Gene may be the only person who's read, Gene and David Gaithel, who's a council member, may be the only people um, who have read the whole record. Um, it was the first fishery management plan developed after the Reauthorization Act in 2006. Uh, it, it made a few more bright lines present. It now implements the congressional intent to stop overfishing, period. You don't get a phased rebuilding. Um, it 
actually created in New England, although other places like the North Pacific had had science committees for some time, created a new science and statistical committee, the purpose of which was to further depoliticize the science advice and take it away, uh, take away some of the elements of that from the council debate. It also required strict new accountability measures, so if the fishery went over its target, they'd have to pay it back the following year. So there wasn't a free ride for overfishing. Um, Accountability measures, uh, new sector programs is another big issue. We will talk about that in their panels. Um, importantly, uh, risk tolerance was still left to the councils. So if they wanted to have a high risk uh, management strategy, um, they were allowed to adopt that. Uh, the sectors were, uh, were um, successful in attracting most of the, attract the active fishermen uh, into their ranks. Um, the the uh, amendment triggered lawsuits. Um, I think I'll go on. So where, how are we doing? Now, the following slides are very controversial. One of the problems in fisheries management in New England is the data is terrible. The social economic data is terrible. And so um, all we as an outside group have access to is the macro data. Um, but it is uh, encouraging in some sense. Um, this is the first four months of the current fishing year, and um, you will see that Amendment 16 has had a differential effect on different ports and different states. Some states, like Massachusetts, um, in terms of the aggregate numbers, are doing much better uh, than they were last year. Um, same with Maine. Um, other states, uh, like New Hampshire, are doing worse. Now again, remember, this is just the first four months, so it doesn't factor in the different fishing strategies that fishermen in these different ports have. So New Hampshire has a lot of fishery closures in the front end of their season, and they do a lot of fishing later on. So uh, this is very preliminary, but there are more revenues coming in under Amendment 16. This also doesn't talk about the distributional effects and whether they're fair, um, uh, whether a select group of people are getting all the benefits and the majority are getting a very few of the benefits. The other thing that I think is really fascinating, this shows the uh, uh, mix of stocks in the ground fish fishery. The blue bars are what the legal catch limit is for this fishing year, which goes from May till April of 2011. And the uh, red lines show what fraction of the available fish uh, the sectors have caught as of August 31st. And you hear a lot about choke species and the inability to stay away from fish that have uh, very low harvest levels set. And in fact, uh, you know, if this information is accurate, um, the sectors are doing a very good job of avoiding the fish that they need to avoid. Uh, a third into the year, um, you know, the uh, Gulf of Maine haddock uh, is the only one that's really over a third of the catch being caught. So uh, there, there are a lot of interpretations of this, but I think one of them is that the sectors are learning how to fish adaptively to target the fish where, that are abundant and avoid the fish uh, that are less abundant. And hopefully that will produce more revenues by the end of the fishing year. And uh, one last thing. Uh, this is just a comment um, from David Pierce, which is maybe uh, important to remember, that if we don't get stewardship from this catch share management program, we'll have failed. Thank you. you to uh, Mr. Madison and Mr. Stevens um, from left to right. Um, I, uh, it, it, as is usually a problem when you're appearing later on a panel, most of my material has been covered. But nevertheless, I'm going to sort of double fast forward through this with my remote clicker um, here. If you've got a DVR, a TiVo, you know a double click goes faster than a single click. So I'm going to go through this stuff pretty quick, give you sort of a nuts and bolts uh, view from a person in the trenches uh, dealing with all of these measures. I think as you uh, listen to the panels here, you're, see, you're going to see how incredibly complex and almost impossible it is to uh, 
uh, develop effective and uh, acceptable fishery management plans uh, in the federal fishing zone here. So uh, I'm going to focus primarily on, on the more recent uh, milestones in the Magnus and Stevens Act. I'm, as Peter uh, indicated, I'm not going to read all of the uh, bullets here. You can try to read them uh, now or uh, in the version that I think will be published with the proceedings of this uh, panel. But uh, uh, first look at 1976, then what happened in 1996, and I'm throwing in another milestone, 1990, which is when I came up to New England to deal with fishery management uh, uh, and Magnus and Stevens Act um, uh, issues as a legal advisor. Uh, and then finally, 2006, and I'm going to give you some uh, sort of visual, visceral kinds of facts and figures to see how changes have occurred over the years. All right, in the, uh, as uh, um, was alluded to earlier, the initial version was about 34 pages. There were 25 definitions contained in uh, the Madison Stevens Act. There were seven national standards. The, f the first one is the, the primary conservation national standard that it existed. It basically only said that, it, uh, and it's still the same, that uh, there's an obligation to end overfishing and achieve optimum yield. Um, the original uh, required provisions, which is another portion of the Madison Act that sort of echoes the national standards, consisted of five national standards. And actually, I should correct the first one there. That's the current version of the required um, uh, provisions. The original one only said that uh, fishery management plans had to be done, uh, had to be consistent um, with national standards and uh, shown to be necessary and appropriate for the conservation and management of the fishery. There was no other details included. And here's the discretionary provisions which basically sets out the types of measures that uh, the council and the agency has legal authority to implement. And you'll notice the seventh one there is pretty much a catch-all which allows the councils and agencies to do anything they want as long as they can relate it to uh, uh, conservation and management. Um, in 1990, when I came up here, the Madison Act, as um, described earlier by Eldon, had doubled in size, 64 pages. There were now 32 definitions, still had um, seven uh, national standards. Uh, the, re the required provisions had um, increased uh, by four. They're highlighted in red there. And the discretionary provisions had added uh, three more um, there. there it, you, you can see the different focuses that were occurring uh, in Congress on what should be addressed. In 1996, which was, um, uh, was when the Sustainable Fisheries Act was passed, which I consider, and I think um, Eldon alluded to this, to be the most conservation-oriented change to the Magnus and Stevens Act. It, uh, by this time, there had been two names added to the Fishery Conservation Management Act, um, uh, recognizing the two senators that were champions of fisheries. Uh, the act doubled again in size. There were now 45 definitions and 10 national standards, uh, 8 through 10 were added. I've highlighted a change, uh, and Eldon alluded to this as well, in National Standard 5. Originally that standard said that councils should uh, promote efficiency and utilization. That was changed in 1996 to consider efficiency and utilization. Uh, required provisions increased uh, uh, significantly. In, that, uh, at, in 1996, there were 14 re uh, required provisions that had to be satisfied or considered in any fishery management plan or amendment to that plan. Um, and the discretionary provisions also uh, uh, increased. Now, the, I think the most significant thing of the 1996 Sustainable Fisheries Act was the addition of Section 304E which is the section that does, which is a section that does basically three things. First, it puts an affirmative obligation on the part of the agency to identify fisheries that were overfished or are overfished uh, or where that are approaching an overfished condition. Before 1996, there was no explicit requirement for the agency to identify such fisheries and to uh, adopt management plans to address the overfished condition. But as of 1996, there's now a requirement for the agency and the councils to develop plans for fisheries that are identified as overfished. 
The second thing it did was once those fisheries have been identified, uh, there's a, a, a specific time frame in which those fisheries have to be addressed. They had to be addressed within two years after the identification. And the third thing done in the Sustainable Fisheries Act was to set up a fairly rigid time frame for rebuilding fisheries that were so identified. And 304E says that all these fisheries identified as being overfished must be rebuilt in 10 years with certain exceptions. Um, but uh, the overall requirement is a 10-year rebuilding time frame. <clears throat> now, in 2006, the Act uh, uh, was most recently amended in a comprehensive way. We now have 170 pages of provisions, 50 definitions, no more additional uh, national standards. Um, we have uh, one additional required provision, number 15, in purple there at the bottom. This is the one that actually s requires uh, uh, fishery management plans to quantify the catch limits that um, are necessary to rebuild f overfishing or to rebuild f overfish stocks, to address overfishing, or to maintain uh, long-term sustainability of uh, fish stocks, and that's. Uh, one of the primary focuses of Amendment 16 to the Groundfish Plan that uh, Peter briefly summarized. Um, there was essentially one other um, discretionary provision uh, added, number 12. It, it, it's actually misnumbered in the law. The, the, they skipped 13. I don't know if that was intentional or not. But the, you see the introduction of, of uh, ecology uh, in this discretionary provision, which is becoming more and more, more, and more a focus of of uh, fishery uh, management worldwide. Now, the regulatory response to all of these requirements, in 1990, when I first came up here, there was a relatively si slim volume of all U.S. fishery regs that comprised 472 pages. The Northeast Multispecies, or the Ground Fish Fishery Management Plan, was 15 pages, which included all the prohibitions and permit requirements and so forth, which have now been separated out of the uh, current version of uh, the multi-species uh, fishery management plan. And you can see by 2008, all fishery regulations uh, uh, are found in now almost 1,500 pages of regulations. And the Northeast Multi-Species Plan, before Amendment 16 was approved and implemented, had expanded to 85 pages. That's one single fishery management plan as uh, represented in the Code of Federal Regulations. Now, uh, what does all this mean in terms of trying to comply with these uh, expanding requirements in, in the statute? I've titled the uh, main dilemma that the councils and the agency uh, faces, uh, face in implementing these requirements as tensions that exist. Senator Whitehouse referred to this. There's a major tension that exists uh, in the Madison-Stevens Act between conserving fish, rebuilding fish stocks, ending overfishing, maintaining continuing sustainability versus all of the other national standards and required provisions that address things like uh, economic impacts, fairness and equity, uh, essential fish habitat, bycatch, so on and so forth. And I think the best way to sort of visualize this is to think of it as a continuum uh, in, in terms of how the council and the agency has to approach fish management. On one end of the continuum, you have the conservation requirements. And on the other end of the continuum, in terms of conservation requirements, you have those requirements that have at least a 50% probability of achieving um, the uh, specified objectives of the Madison-Stevens uh, uh, Fishery Conservation Act. And the reason I pick 50% is courts have held that uh, in order for a fishery management plan to at least pass a threshold of achieving uh, conservation objectives, there has to be a, at least a 50 percent probability that the management measures will achieve the conservation objectives that are part of that plan. So it, this um, spectrum of likelihood of achieving the conservation uh, objectives becomes the playing field for determining where on that continuum you have to identify the optimum yield for every fishery that we're dealing with. And there is no legal um, standard that tells you where in between that continuum you have to establish optimum yield for each fishery. Uh, the agency uh, and courts look at the, this um, 
uh, where to place the, the, the point on the continuum in terms of whether the council has adequately considered all of the provisions that I've put up here and whether there's a rational basis for choosing the point on this continuum where they want to manage fisheries. Now, uh, there are tensions within tensions here. For instance, the optimum yield requirement uh, can be looked at from a national perspective in terms of sort of general economics. What's, what's the best uh, economically efficient way to produce fish for the benefit of, of the nation? Or it can be looked at or has to be uh, uh, contrasted with the local optimum yield. What's best for local communities and local fishermen? You have fairness and equity concerns that have to be addressed under National Standard 4. Most fisheries in the United States now operate under what is known as a limited access fisheries, where you cap the number of fishermen that can fish in a fishery, and you have to come, uh, the councils have to come up with criteria for determining which fishermen are in the fishery, which fishermen are out of the fishery, based on standards that the National, that the uh, Madison-Stevens Act sets, sets forth. By definition, when you may draw a line as to which fishermen are in the fishery and which fishermen are out of the fishery, you create uh, problems, uh, or at least perceived problems, of fairness and equity. Who are the haves, who are the have-nots? Um, uh, councils have to wrestle with the idea, do you give, uh, do you allow only a few fishermen into a fishery so that they have a, a, a good chance of making a living at the fishery, or do you try to, <laughs> try to spread, spread out the fishery uh, amongst many fishermen so that you maximize employment and provide more people an opportunity to fish. These are very subjective, controversial, philosophical kinds of calls that the fishery management councils are dealing with every time they, they deal with a, uh, uh, a fishery management plan or amendment to a fishery management plan. Efficiency, which is a national standard five uh, concept, is one, for example, that we're dealing with in the scallop fishery. There are certain uh, components of the scallop fishery that want to um, consolidate and allow uh, allocations to be stacked on to more than one vessel to reduce cost. And there are other fishermen that think that that will lead to vertical integration and corporatization of the fishery. It's, there's no right or wrong answer to that. It's a, it's a subjective call. Uh, the agency can't dictate it necessarily. We can only look at whether the councils have uh, um, established a, 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 a rational basis for making a choice on this continuum as to where they're going to put the, pati the particular measures uh, that might deal with efficiency. Now, um, here's, here's a, a whole bunch of other tensions that I've come up with that exist uh, every time a fishery management plan is developed or an amendment to a plan is developed. I'm not going to go through all of them because of time, but you can see every one of them is, is a difficult a dilemma facing a council. And it's, uh, it's a daunting task to go through all of these as a council member and as an agency that has to approve or disapprove these things. Now, in addition to management tensions, we have procedural tensions. What kind of regulatory or uh, act, federal action are we going to pick to implement these, these measures. Uh, the act refer, uh, describes an amendment process which has prescribed time limits, et cetera, but most councils have developed a sort of uh, way to get around that through what are called framework adjustments that don't require as much procedure or time uh, uh, to, to implement these, uh, to implement new measures. So there's a constant uh, um, tension between the type of uh, procedural uh, action that's chosen to either temporarily or permanently put into place um, uh, council recommendations. Um, just real quickly about the approval versus disapproval tension. Uh, when uh, uh, the council submits a fishery management plan to the agency, the agency is limited to only approving or disapproving the plan or partially approving it. We cannot substantively change it. If, even if we would have picked a different way of approaching conservation uh, problems, as long as the council can show that it had a rational basis for picking the, the uh, measures that it did that meet the uh, requirements of the Madison-Stevens Act, we're pretty much obligated to approve those measures. Sometimes we find part of the plan is approvable, another part is disapprovable. That becomes a dilemma for the agency in deciding whether it's uh, segregated, uh, whether there's a discrete uh, 
uh, whether the action that's disapprovable or the recommendation that's disapprovable is discreet enough that if you disapprove it, you're not going to throw undermine the, the entire purpose and benefit of the, the rest of the measures. Uh, finally, well, there's, we have two more tensions. I'm almost done. These are all the other laws that we have to find, uh, be consistent with. And then we have council makeup tensions. Every person on the council has a different philosophy and view of what they're doing. And you have to get them to reach at least a majority approval of dealing with all of these other tensions that exist. Thank you. <laughs> I always see Jean at the council meetings going. <laughs> Josh, no power. Ready? Yes. Yeah. You're good. Okay. <clears throat> I'm actually going to talk about something that's a little bit narrower in scope um, than the prior talks, uh, in that I'm going to talk about one specific part of the Magnuson-Stevens Act um, and a little bit about how it has evolved or how it hasn't evolved over time and make an argument for why maybe it ought to. Um, for those of you who are not very familiar uh, with the Magnuson-Stevens Act, uh, the Act is the most important and unique aspect of the Act as compared to other natural resources laws uh, are the councils, the eight regional fishery management councils. For those of you not familiar uh, with the councils, uh, they're unique because they directly involve members of the public, not government officials, members of the public in making important resource allocation and conservation decisions about uh, a, res a publicly owned resource. That does not exist in any other statute, whether it be forest, water, uh, any other kind of resource. And in fact, I, there are, well, there are only a few examples I've been able to find uh, elsewhere in the world that are close to that. So it's a very unique system. Um, and historically, the other kind of fact to know, well, that's, that's the, the uh, statute, the fact to know about the councils over time is that since uh, 1976, uh, because um, we can talk about that later if we have time, of the, the way the process and the uh, works of nominating and appointing uh, uh, members of the public to the councils, uh, and because of the politics of it, uh, we've ended up with about 80% plus of council members, these appointed members, which make up only about half of each council, uh, the appointed public members are representatives of either commercial, recreational, fishing, industry interests. Sometimes we'll have some processors. Uh, the other 20% tend to be the occasional academic. I think there have been maybe four or five uh, members of environmental groups in 35 years who have been appointed to serve on council. So they're historically dominated uh, by industry. Um, when, when I was asked to talk about something today, I was, felt very liberated, uh, right? There, there's a, uh, uh, Susan mentioned there's a uh, uh, rule that we can kind of think about things that aren't politically feasible. Uh, the reason I asked Senator Whitehouse the question earlier, for those of you who are here, when Senator Stevens was alive and in the Senate, uh, the councils were the sacred cow. Um, despite the fact, it's true, Eldon says, if you look through that big orange book, there's zero discussion of what the optimal management system ought to be uh, for fisheries, but Senator Stevens was very attached. Uh, to him, the councils were a sacred cow. I mean, if you think about it, you have your constituents, the ones who are likely to complain to you, actually in charge of management, right? So it's the perfect uh, political system from his perspective. And at least according to Senator Stevens, there was a place underground with extremely hot flames uh, that was reserved for those who might venture to even tamper or mention uh, changing the composition of the councils. At least that's what he told me. Uh, uh, so uh, now that Senator Stevens is no longer in the Senate uh, and uh, we have this sort of uh, new approach, I think it is, it, I won't say it's likely, but it's at least we can talk about it. Uh, now uh, whether we might want to think about changing from that 80 percent plus industry composition model. And I'm going to argue that it's a good idea for a couple reasons, one of which, surprisingly, uh, I think is that uh, I think it might actually provide some benefits to industry, uh, even though I don't think they would agree with that. Um, okay, couple, so I'm going to run real quick through the argument. Uh, number one, why are the councils so important and why is composition so important? I mentioned uh, why uh, the councils are important. They're at the heart of every single 
every single, even with the, the 2007 amendments that gave uh, SSE power over tax, they're at the heart of every single important conservation allocation decision under the statute. I don't think there's any question about that. NIMS's role is very limited by the terms of the statute and in practice to reviewing council decisions, but uh, NIMS does not have significant power and has not historically uh, acted uh, independently or overturning council decisions or things like that. It does happen on occasion. So the councils are at the heart of the act. Composition matters uh, for something that was brought up uh, set by several of the speakers, which is every one of those important conservation allocation decisions um, is characterized by incredible uh, uncertainty in the scientific and social data that's available. So making a decision requires the application of individual human values and preferences to the facts at hand. Okay, people matter in this system and the orientation of people, um, and that might mean you know, people who tend to be optimistic or willing to take, uh, Peter mentioned, risk preferences, willing to treat, uh, take more risks uh, with respect to overfishing than other people are going to reach a different conclusion. So people matter, it's not a uh, machine. Okay, in addition to the uncertainty in the scientific information, people matter because uh, as uh, Professor Reeser has written about in the past, the language is chock full, like many uh, statutes, uh, of very vague and ambiguous language uh, so, for example, to the maximum extent practicable, we see that um, in all kinds of, um, uh, both with respect to bycatch and habitat, uh, we see language like that throughout the act, and of course, again, that requires resolving, making that decision about how much, uh, say, bycatch to allow, requires uh, application of personal values. Okay, so their councils and composition are important. Second, um, the Historical rationales, and there really weren't any that were laid out ahead of time, but rationales have been developed over time for why the councils are a good, uh, productive part of the statute. None of them really make sense, especially now, given, as um, Eldon pointed out, the rise of environmentalism. Okay, that the idea that we should have the environmentalists on the outside of this statute um, is probably doesn't make so much sense anymore. And I don't. Well, I'll talk about other groups besides uh, marine conservation. In a second. Um, the original rationale, actually Senator Stevens, uh, only wanted councils to be involved in conservation. He was, uh, if you read through there um, and talk to the staffers, uh, you will find that he did not want councils involved in allocation, and you can understand why that is, um, right? Essentially, it's a strange business model to have 10 people or 15 people from a business sector uh, allocating profits to the other 1,000 people in that business. Uh, that's a very unusual uh, system, and he felt that all fisheries should be essentially races, derby fisheries. We know they have bad consequences, of course, now but that the fishermen should really be involved only in setting uh, limits. Um, he felt that uh, Senator Stevens' rationale for having industry heavily involved was that because they depended economically on fisheries, they would make conservation decisions consistent with the long-term health of the fishery, right? Makes sense. The only problem is that really only, that argument only works when the decision makers actually own the fishery, and that's not true with councils. Council members don't even stay on councils for long periods of time, uh, uh, or some do, but uh, not permanently. And so it turned out that, in fact, um, councils didn't make those, or council members didn't vote for those kind of measures that had long-term sustainability in mind consistently. Um, one of the reasons was there were many forces lined up against doing that, namely what uh, Peter pointed out, making allocation decisions in overcapitalized fishery, the best route, the easiest route, if you're a council member, is make more fish to give out, and the way you make more fish is you use that uncertainty in the science to increase tax. So it takes you away from a long-term sustainable view. Second historical rationale, council, well, and actually this has come into vogue in the 90s, right? Uh, well, you know, uh, they shouldn't do conservation because they don't know anything about science, but they should do allocation because they're very familiar with the business of fishing. I'm not really, I'd never have understood that argument, um, why councils or members should allocate again to uh, their peers and their competitors' profits. Um, and my guess is, Peter said, uh, mentioned that they had originally started their uh, conservation uh, litigation based on calls from fishermen. Well, the fishermen were, might, might have been calling because they were concerned about conservation, but more likely they were calling to use conservation as a tool to attack an allocation that they were unhappy with. That's how we often see these things uh, come up. So. I don't, I'm not uh, sure at all why, uh, maybe someone can tell me why the councils would be good at allocation. Uh, I think it's actually out there, they're even worse, or would be even, should be even worse at allocation when long-term rights-based management systems are being put into place because 
at least under an annual allocation system, if you're a council member, you might have fear of future rep retribution if you don't treat people fairly in these long-term systems, of course, when they're not going to come up again for a while, uh, that fear goes away. Um, third rationale, industry members understand industry. Um, can dismiss this one quickly. That's true in every case in the United States of a regulated industry, but we don't use councils in any other context um, because the dangers or the perceived dangers of having industry write its own regulations are seen to outweigh the benefits. Uh, number four rationale, um, I hear this one a lot recently, uh, industry members, um, you're, you're being, uh, treating them as, as if they're homogenous. They actually are quite capable of representing other interests, including the general public. A lot of them are conservation oriented. We see that right in New England. We've got some uh, members who are conservation oriented. Um, I think there's truth to that. They're not um, homogenous. First of all, uh, one argument against this view would be that surveys of council members show that that's not actually what they do. They actually see themselves as representing their sectors. They don't put themselves into the position of the sort of what's best for the public. Um, at least that's not their first priority. Um, but my biggest argument would be sort of a hypothetical I'd throw out there to you. If you don't think um, that, if you, or if you, if you don't think that council members, uh, uh, how should I put this? Um, Imagine a council where 90% of, or 80% of the members were from marine conservation groups and ask yourselves whether they would make the same decisions as your conservation-minded council members. And if you're, a council, if you're a New England council and you would agree to that, um, then maybe I would believe you that you represent uh, uh, conservation in the general public. Um, the final rationale, which is kind of a clandestine one, okay, uh, is that Conservation groups have no legitimate interest being involved in fishery management. It wasn't so clandestine when I used to go to council meetings and people would essentially tell you that. Um, but that's a pretty preeminent, a, pr a, a predominant view out there. Um, I'll give you just some examples of uh, one of my favorite surveys of all time. This is a Coast Guard survey of uh, council members and actually NIFS uh, fishery uh, management employees. What are the greatest threats to maintaining sustainable fisheries in your region? Number one, bycatch. Number two, environmental non-governmental organizations. Ahead of overcapacity, gear conflict, environmental effects, et cetera, okay? So there's a view out there uh, that essentially uh, there shouldn't be representatives on the councils because they don't belong there. Um, obviously, that's a phony rationale, in my opinion. Two reasons. There's a public resource. It's a long-standing tradition of being a public resource. These are essentially public $10 bills swimming around there in the ocean. And the idea that one group should be able to invest them non-conservatively when another group thinks maybe they ought to be invested more conservatively, that is left in, in the ocean for other reasons, uh, doesn't really make sense. Moreover, more importantly, from the industry perspective, I would say that they have to realize that environmental groups are here, they're not going away. If they don't have access through the council decision-making process, they will have access in other ways, that is, through the courts or by going to Congress, and those results may not actually uh, be as good as if you had uh, negotiated the original decision with uh, the, uh, these other kinds of members. Okay. So what are the options for reforming the councils, okay, in terms of composition? One option uh, I would call the no council option, right? We could simply go with the model that's used in every other natural resource decision-making process, which would be use NIMS. Um, I'm not a big fan of that one personally, nothing uh, against NIMS, but I actually think that one of the things the councils do is they provide a more transparent mechanism for decision-making than uh, agencies ordinarily do. Uh, every, everything's out in the open. There's a lot of public discussion. Um, I actually like that. I think uh, we see a lot of industries where, uh, sorry, a lot of agencies where industries have kind of a uh, backdoor uh, way to get in and we never see what's actually going on. Um, we could go to fewer appointed members or no appointed members and just use councils made up of state government representatives, so similar to sort of the Marine Fisheries Commissions. I'm also not a big fan of this. What you see on uh, Atlantic State's Marine Fisheries Commission is a lot of allocation battles just between states. So uh, the focus is getting fish for my state as opposed to uh, actually representing a variety of interests. Um, more diverse councils, I actually think, would benefit a lot of, uh, provide a lot of benefits. So when I say more diverse, I don't mean just marine conservation members. I mean even people who don't know a lot about fisheries, members of the general public, say a mayor uh, of a, a town or a coastal town or something like that. Um, I think it would tremendously re reduce the adversarial relationships that plague fisheries, both between NIMS and the councils and between the environmental groups and the councils. Um, by forcing these people uh, to actually work together rather than to resort to litigation and the legislative uh, end-arounds. 
I think over time, we'll build trust and uh, NGOs would develop more sensitivity to industry concerns through this partnership. NIMS could play a more appropriate role of a neutral reviewer of decisions. Um, and m mostly, there would be a greater perception of fairness and the system would be more fair given that we're trying to uh, distribute a public resource among people who have very different views of how that resource ought to be used. Um, so in conclusion, I would say, you know, this is something we can talk about now, uh, and it's worth thinking about, even though it might be painful at first, whether in the long run this might not produce a more efficient system. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm, uh, as Susan did such a nice job of introducing me, uh, Mike Conathan. I work for Senator Snow on the extremely long titled Commerce, Science, Transportation Committee, Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and Coast Guard. And we're working on that, but we like all of those things, so we don't actually want to cut any of them out, um, which is why we end up being so long. Also, um, as somebody who, who works in the Senate and therefore you know, has to wear a suit every day. I wanted to point out that I'm the only one up there not actually in the tie because I take every opportunity that I can to get out of it. Um, so apologize for the informality if it's offending anyone, but hopefully uh, we can all roll with that. Um, uh, I did graduate from URI's uh, Marine Affairs program with, uh, with Masters in uh, Marine Affairs in 05 and have been working on the Commerce Committee ever since, um, which put me down there sort of just in time to um, witness the actual final passage of the 2006-2007 amendments. The, just to clarify, it, it actually passed Congress at the end of 2006 in what I think was actually the last or maybe the second to last vote taken in the House of Representatives uh, that year. It was the ultimate under the wire um, uh, as the clock was expiring sort of buzzer beater of, um, uh, of that Congress. Um, and uh, it was subsequently not signed into law until after the holidays. So we get this confusion over whether it's 2006 or 2007. I like 2006 because, you know, I'm partial to Congress's action as opposed to the president, but that's just me. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, folks who have been recognizing um, Senator Stevens, who was actually the, the chair of the committee when I started working down there. And, and I did have an opportunity to work with him uh, and, and see him work so um, effectively and, uh, and, and, and be so involved in this issue that was really so integral to him. Um, I, I, I think he perhaps wouldn't just roll over in his grave uh, at the last presentation, but actually be trying to climb out of it and <laughs> put the Hulk tie back on, um, which he was so famous for wearing on the Senate floor when he really got into hardcore debate mode to, to sort of get his dander up and, and protect his, uh, what he perceived to be his interests. And, and that, um, you yeah, know, we, we miss that energy, certainly, uh, when it comes to these issues. Um, he was a, a tremendous advocate, and, and uh, he's, he's missed uh, in the Senate, not the least of, of which for his bipartisan, his, willing to work, his willingness to work uh, in a bipartisan fashion, which um, fortunately has really rubbed off on us in the Commerce Committee, and, and we do continue to, uh, to work in that fashion, and I'll discuss how that's going to impact um, sort of the future of fisheries and ocean policy negotiations, um, which is really what I'm here to talk about. We've had a great um, summary of the, the history and some of the key issues involved in the Magnuson Act. Obviously, they're, you know, we're just scratching the surface here. Um, this is, you know, the, the, the book in front of Gene kind of tells the story of, of how much there is to really dig into. Um, and uh, it's, it's so, my, my role here is to talk about what's next um, in this process. Uh, the, the current authorization uh, that we passed in 2006 is going to expire in, in 2012, um, which means that we have sort of already entered into, although it seems like just yesterday that we reauthorized it, we're already entering into the season now where we're going to have to talk about the next reauthorization and, and, be, and begin that, uh, those, those conversations in earnest. Um, you know, just because the authorization expires in 2012 obviously doesn't mean that we need to have something done by 2012 because last time the authorization expired in 99 and it was seven years until it was actually uh, uh, officially reauthorized and so hopefully we can avoid that circumstance arising again. Um, but as we do that, uh, the issues that are going to become really the, the sort of primary focus of these uh, conversations, um, we can already start to, have a, to get a sense of, of where this is headed. Um, there are a few bills that have already been introduced in this Congress um, dealing with some of the issues that, that other presenters have talked about. Um, 
specifically uh, legislation introduced by Representative Pallone and Senator Schumer uh, to deal with issues of flexibility and rebuilding timelines. Uh, this is something that's fairly controversial uh, based on the amendments that have gone before that have sort of stipulated this 10-year uh, rebuilding timeline. And, and as these economic considerations bump up against the conservation considerations, um, there will perpetually be an effort to add additional flexibility, uh, and so that's something that we're going to have to fight out uh, over the next couple of years. Um, a, another major issue is, is going to be the issue of fishery science um, and, and sort of uh, clarifying the role of uh, not only fisheries biology but also the socioeconomic analyses that are, that are required under the law to come up with uh, catch limits and really uh, be able to establish the ACLs and the accountability measures, annual catch limits and accountability measures that were put in place under uh, the 2006 reauthorization. Um, so we've got our work cut out for us uh, going ahead, um, and, and I also want to talk a little bit about the process that's going to allow that work to take place, and Senator Whitehouse uh, really did a better job um, sort of laying that out uh, than I possibly could, but, but the, the issue of um, the use of the, the sort of filibuster and uh, uh, holds that can be placed on bills is one that we are going to have to deal with. Uh, when we did pass Magnuson in, in 2006, uh, even then uh, it, was a, it was a bill that had to be passed by a process known as unanimous consent in the Senate, which uh, basically means that any senator can block a bill from, from, from being passed. Uh, if, you, if you get unanimous consent, it means that effectively all 100 senators have said, we're willing to let this go without a vote, and obviously that's something that rarely takes place these days um, in, the, in the culture of, of the filibuster. Um, so uh, that is really the, the major obstacle that, that we're going to be facing as we look towards this, um, this reauthorization. Um, because when you get right down to it, the idea of, of six days of uh, what is already uh, an extremely short legislative calendar um, to deal with a fisheries issue, which all of us think is certainly worth that level of attention, but, uh, but may not have that, uh, that perspective from a nationwide, uh, when you look at it from a nationwide um, view, uh, that's, that's unlikely to happen. So whatever the, the result is that comes out of this process, it's likely to be something um, where all of these, uh, these uh, concerns and conflicts are going to have to be worked out in advance, which means my job gets tougher. But that's what I'm here for, so I'm happy to go ahead and do that. Uh, and basically, if, 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 you, if you put this in terms uh, um, that uh, perhaps some of the attorneys in the room are, are a little more familiar with, you can look at this as the difference between basically taking a case to trial and settling it. There's a lot more uh, work up in, in advance. Uh, the negotiations that are involved in a settlement are basically what we're looking for uh, in terms of uh, unanimous consent. So. Uh, um, and uh, as, I, as I referenced, even in 2006 when we were seven years behind and we had a, uh, uh, really a more uh, bipartisan Congress uh, operating in a more bipartisan fashion, we're still looking at a, at a uh, uh, unanimous consent process to pass this bill. Um, I also want to address, I'd, I mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the compromise that, that we tend to carry over on the Commerce Committee, which is, which is a leftover from Senator Stevens and, and uh, the work that he did with Senator Inouye, uh, who was uh, chair of the committee at that time. Um, and, and it really comes down as well to the fact that the issues that we deal with on the subcommittee um, tend to transcend party alliance, and, and they really adhere more to sort of geographic distributions. Coastal members uh, of different parties may diverge on some issues, um, but they tend to want to protect the economy and, and the ecology of their coastal regions, of course. And on a smaller scale, uh, we tend to get regional interests together, trumping national interests. Um, and so you see uh, the Republican members that I work with, um, Senator Snow, uh, obviously Senator Whitehouse, working together very closely on, on many oceans issues, um, really coming together um, to address the concerns that, that, you're, that you've heard about from, from folks here in the ground fishery, you see similar things happening in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and yet still uh, doesn't mean there's a unanimous voice. And so as fisheries adapt to, um, to the mandates in the last reauthorization, particularly catch limits and accountability measures um, and authority to develop catch year programs, um, divergences of opinion are, are certainly becoming uh, more prevalent. Um, unemployment economic considerations become major policy drivers, and so you've got um, region, members from regions with fisheries um, that are threatened by these catch reductions, uh, folks are starting to scream about uh, the effect that this ultimately has on 
employment in coastal communities and, and economic development in coastal communities um, and, and really tend to exert then more pressure on their uh, members of Congress to represent their economic interest uh, in the short term as well as the long term. And so you get these, uh, these movements toward introducing um, uh, bills to include flexibility and, and really try to um, look at some of these um, underlying linchpins of the law uh, that have been put in place uh, and supported so strenuously by the conservation community over the years. Um, and uh, in New England you see not just at a, uh, in a, from a legislative perspective, we're also seeing it very much at the regulatory level um, with pressure on the National Marine Fisheries Service, on the Council to find ways to, uh, to increase catch limits in the ground fishery um, while still acting within the law and adhering to uh, the goals of the Magnuson Stevens Act to end overfishing and, and rebuild these depleted stocks within the time frames that have been established in the law. Um, and we see, uh, we've seen in recent uh, months uh, pressure for regulatory action, including uh, use of the uh, secretarial action, uh, secretarial, excuse me, emergency authority that's included in the law to uh, increase catch limits outside the council process. Um, this is a, a fairly controversial measure. Um, uh, which uh, Secretary Locke, Secretary of Commerce, has become very personally involved in. He's made numerous trips up here to the region, uh, attempting to come to some form of compromise that will allow um, uh, the fishery to uh, continue to operate under the new sector management system uh, as, as we try to move that process forward uh, and, and really uh, give that an opportunity to uh, address some of the overfishing uh, that has been going on uh, in this fishery for for generations, uh, sorry, years, probably not generations. Some folks would take issue with that. But. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, so in any case, there's gonna be pressure as we move forward to include additional fishery, to uh, flexibility for fisheries management uh, from that rebuilding timeline. Whether that actually makes it into law or not, um, you know, that's gonna be uh, a fight that's, that's ongoing. Um, I think uh, uh, there's, there's been some uh, conversation that we may have come to a crossroads with regard to the 10-year timeline. Some folks have begun to question whether it's appropriate to have uh, a single uh, deadline applicable to all species, um, uh, sort of regardless of biology. Um, uh, the the counter-argument to that being that if you don't have a, a firm deadline in place, uh, as we didn't prior to the 96 amendments, then uh, you just see um, effectively the overfishing allowed to continue uh, indefinitely as we wait for perhaps new science to come along and, and, uh, and uh, hope that things get better in the future. Um, so uh, let's see, I'm trying to skip ahead and hit the points here so that we're covered at the end. Um, so ultimately, uh, what we're going to have here is a, is a strong push to figure, it, uh, to figure out how to, um, I, I, I think, figure out what the points are that we can all basically agree on. And I, I think the, the, the greatest thing that I've seen on that front is that what we all uh, can, can agree on is that the science that, that is used to set these catch limits currently uh, simply isn't sufficient to, to do the job. Um, Senator Snow commissioned a report by the uh, Inspector General uh, investigating the uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center uh, in 2009, and the result of that was to, to show that while uh, scientists are in fact doing the best they can with the science that they have available to them, the science that they have available to them is, is in many ways insufficient to, uh, to set catch limits with the level of, uh, of certainty that the law now requires uh, in providing annual catch limits uh, in each fishery um, that are not to be exceeded by council action. Um, so really what we're going to see at this point is a movement towards strengthening science in the Act, uh, providing a framework that can support better stock assessments uh, that includes uh, cooperative research um, and, uh, and other efforts to, to really underline that, um, that if, if we're having policy that is, that is so reliant on uh, scientific information, we really need to provide our managers with information that they can use to set the catch limits uh, really to the best of their ability. Um, so I'll leave it there. I haven't had a chance to touch on several other issues that I wanted to get to, catch shares obviously being key among them, um, as well as uh, issues of, of uh, future sustainability. But uh, in the interest of time, um, I will leave it at that. So thank you.
Well, Susan, I'm, I think Susan asked this question first, and I'm, I'm very sorry you did because I struggled with it and couldn't come up with anything that I thought was a very good answer. And I went back and looked at a chapter I wrote on fisheries in a textbook 20 years ago, and I went through all the options, and at the end, I concluded that the system we had was the least worst system that I could imagine, uh, which is what Winston Churchill said about democracy. Uh, and, and I think that the two elements of the system th that we have that are, are really critical, one is decision making by the councils, and two, uh, a system of, of national standards which are regionally applied by those councils is a pretty good one. And I think you can modify the system around the edges and you can argue that the Secretary of Commerce and NIMS should exercise greater authority than they have to rein in councils when the councils are not hewing to the national standards and the other requirements of the Act. I think on the whole, the structure we have is pretty good. So if I were going to rewrite the statute, I might try to make it simpler. But I wouldn't fundamentally alter the structure. I, I think the issue that um, I, I would focus on would be dealing with what I call the undercapitalization of science and management. Um, you know, this is one of the few, one of the only natural resources um, that the U.S. Uh, manages where no resource rents are collected from the users. Uh, in the other areas, they're fairly minimal, but at least uh, uh, token uh, range fees and stumpage fees and uh, other um, uh, revenue uh, gets raised from the uh, people who are uh, converting those public resources into economic goods. And um, I think at some level we have to, you know, maybe it's the National Endowment, uh, maybe it's other mechanisms, but we have to figure out ways to fund science and management, and particularly the data. Um, I think uh, from my perspective, the weakest data right now is in the social and economic domains. Uh, we make, we're making major decisions about this resource based on anecdotes at microphones uh, that there's really no way to validate um, out in the field. So social, economic, um, and then I think the third data set that we just have to make better investments in um, is getting uh, a better sense of how many and what kinds of fish are actually getting killed out on the water, not how much gets landed at the docks, but uh, what the actual mortalities are so that uh, the models can actually be uh, uh, run with real data rather than uh, proxy data or other um, surrogates for the real data. So, uh, but that requires funding. Uh, it's not a technology issue, it's really just a matter of funding and Congress has not uh, supported it for obvious reasons and we don't have the climate right now. So, I think we really should start talking about some level of resource rents as well as other tools uh, that we're in strong agreement with like the National Endowment. Um, as a, as a mechanism. I'm going to, uh, and I must condition my opinion here as being my own, particularly since my boss is sitting in the, uh, <laughs> and, and my main clients are also in the audience, but uh, uh, I'm going to pick a very practical um, provision that I think needs to be looked at, and, and it already is being looked at, and that is the rigidity of the time frame for rebuilding fisheries. I, I appreciate the idea that, and this is in Section 304E that I talked about very quickly, I appreciate that the Madison-Stevens Act now requires a quantifiable limit on how long it takes or how long a fishery management plan can take to rebuild fisheries, but I think the uh, setting as uh, just uh, basically an arbitrary time period for that creates uh, more problems than it solves. So I think there needs to be some creativity in developing a less rigid, rigid standard that still manages to maintain some uh, extreme parameter uh, that, that will guide councils in, in, um, in developing effective rebuilding plans. Um, I know the New England groundfish fisheries is probably the poster child for, for, for problems in, in addressing fish, fishery management measures. And, Having this fairly rigid uh, rebuilding standard invites all kinds of political uh, influence um, and, and rhetoric that I think really gets in the way of effective management. So 
that would be my, my choice, and apparently it, it is being looked at now in, in, in Congress. Okay, well, I pretty much already uh, think, told, <laughs> told you what my change would be. I would say, I mean, what, talking about the, tying it into the flexibility issues and the rebuilding uh, timeframes, I mean, the reason we have that is because before that, and actually many councils using the exceptions that are in there now based on the biology of the stock, we saw, you know, timeframes that were, I mean, I can use the word ridiculous, uh, you know, 50 years, 60 years, uh, things like that, where essentially they weren't rebuilding the stock. I mean, at least the chances of it being rebuilt were microscopic and certainly would be deferred. Um, but I would argue, tying this into the composition issue, that essentially what's happening there is you've got environmental groups over a long period of time, or marine conservation groups, uh, lobbying for these external controls on council decision making. Why? Because they're not actually involved in making the decision. So they're that's the only option. I think a lot of the need for a lot of that stuff or the, um, the pressure uh, from that outside external control by Congress or by courts would go away if uh, the conservation interests, which are, like I said, not going away and do feel powerfully, powerfully vested in this issue, were intimately involved in the decision making from the beginning. Um, I actually believe that, that, um, that those, those stringent controls, the view has always been from the conservation community that those kind of stringent controls were necessary to keep the councils in line because otherwise the rebuilding periods would be infinite, which is what we were seeing. So I think that's, those are a symptom of the marginal, marginalization of other groups interested in fishery management. Um, yeah, I, I want to pick up on a, on a couple of threads that came up from, from some of these other answers. First being that, that I need to also issue a disclaimer that, that my statements do not represent the perspective of, uh, of my boss or the Commerce Committee. Um, the, one, of the, one of the questions that makes a congressional staffer the most nervous is one that, that where he could potentially be quoted uh, by name and, and, uh, rather than uh, attributed. Uh, and, but I think, you know, given President Champagne's assertion in, in, in his speech that, that these univer universities are a safe place for rational discourse, I'm, I'm willing to dip my toe in the pool here. Um, and, and just to clarify something on, on flexibility and, and sort of where those efforts stand in the Senate, there, there are bills that have been introduced, one by, as I said, Senator Schumer, one by uh, Senator Nelson as well, to address some issues in, uh, in the Gulf and the Snapper Grouper Fishery. Neither of those bills has, uh, has gained momentum even to move through the Commerce Committee. Uh, and I think that speaks to the fact that, that tinkering with flexibility remains uh, a very controversial issue when it comes to fisheries management uh, and, and uh, not one that is likely to uh, move anytime soon. Um, that said, it, it is something that is certainly worthy of significant debate. Um, I, I think that probably in, in terms of changes, uh, the, the key issue as I, as I touched on towards the end of my talk was uh, improvement in science and, and uh, ensuring that we uh, build uh, build into the law the opportunity uh, for uh, additional scientific research to be done um, and, and authorization for funding to be spent on that uh, research. Uh, one, one key point is that in an authorizing bill, we don't actually spend money. That is the job of the Appropriations Committee. And that is, uh, across the board, a key fight in, in Congress right now uh, is uh, budgetary concerns. Um, so I think we need um, a mandate for, for more frequent stock assessments, uh, better development of fisheries models, data collection, uh, ocean observing, and including socioeconomic data in these, um, these scientific uh, models that are, being, that are being developed as well as the funding for them. Um, and perhaps National Endowment for the Oceans can fac help facilitate that issue as well. Great. Thanks. Why don't we take questions from the audience now? And my other job as moderator is to repeat your questions so that we have them uh, recorded. Um, questions? Anyone? Yes, sir. Uh, this is for Josh A. Uh, uh, Senator Whitehouse talked about there, that, that there isn't a constituency for the oceans. Uh, so where do the people, other than fishing interests, pool of people to be appointed to councils other than fishermen. Where do they come from? And why don't we see that now? Why don't we see individual citizens who are not part of commercial or recreational fishery stepping up for appointment? Just to repeat the question, the question is why aren't people, aren't the more members of the general public appointed to councils where, now? Where does the pool come from? Okay, well first question, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting question. I think what you would see is just an expansion. I, I would venture to guess that certainly there are lots of 
Um, of the, and when we talk about conservation groups, there's a whole spectrum of conservation groups. Um, uh, so from, you know, I don't know, more extreme to, to more central, but I think all those groups would be interested in um, having representation on, on councils. Um, academics uh, have traditionally uh, been involved, whether fisheries uh, scientists, marine biologists, social scientists, certainly be interested in being involved. Um, and I think also, you know, the way the process works, it's up to governors to nominate. So, um, for example, I'm, I serve on a coastal management commission in South Carolina. We have mayors and legislators who don't have any particular background or expertise, but they were asked to serve in this capacity because they have a great wealth of, of general management experience and could add some new ideas. The reason we don't see that now is because the language of the staff, well, two reasons. One is because the process of having governors nominate, essentially, right, those people are going to be, uh, not, governors are going to nominate groups that will reward them politically. Um, and the language of the statute speaks of active, guaranteeing a certain number of seats for active participants in the fishery. So the language is actually specifically uh, meant to exclude or favor, I should say, uh, the fishery, exclude non-fishery participants or favor fishery participants. So you'd have to rewrite that, you'd have to work on the nomination process, you'd have to work on uh, directions to the Secretary of Commerce in terms of picking, choosing from those nomination lists. Uh, but I don't think you'd have a problem finding people to serve. Um, because the councils, again, we're talking about, uh, there are 110 council members or something like that in the United States, so you're talking about you need to recruit 20 new people or something like that. That's all we're really talking about. I'm taking over the moderator uh, role. Jared had to go teach a class, and apparently students think they need to go to his class. It's con law, so it's probably important. Uh, we are running a little bit late, but again, I want to offer you all an opportunity for questions. We have about five minutes, and we'll still have an hour for lunch, so I know you're all hungry, but hang in there. Yes? So the question had to do with streamlining efforts and changes that can be made to the act in reauthorization. Um, yeah, the issue of uh, interagency participation is one that we deal with in, in pretty much every ocean policy initiative that comes through the committee, which is basically every ocean policy initiative that we deal with in the Senate. And um, it is an ongoing problem, uh, I think, uh, in terms of getting uh, different federal agencies to cooperate uh, effectively. Uh, and part of that uh, goes back to um, agencies wanting to protect their jurisdiction over issues, part of it goes back to, to uh, the, the funding um, that comes into agencies and restrictions on, on how they can use the money that they're, that they're allocated, that they're appropriated by Congress. Um, and as agencies frequently feel that the money that, that they have is, is they're not officially allowed to say this, but I think if, if they were, they would be able, they would say that the money that they have, they can always use more, and so they, they need to use their funding to uh, apply to, uh, to their specific role. Um, and so when you talk about trying to increase coordination among agencies, it, it gets, it becomes a very difficult thing very quickly. Uh, and we have uh, looked at various ways of doing that, interagency committees, uh, and Things, things of that nature, and ultimately, it's it's a tough it's a tough nut to crack. Um, trying to figure out how to bring agencies to the table and participate actively in these conversations. Um, so I don't think that's a very satisfactory answer, other than just to say that it's it's we acknowledge that it is an ongoing difficulty in a lot of different capacities, not just in fisheries management, and it's something that we're trying to address. Other thoughts from the panel on that, Peter? I, I think there have been efforts to um, make the tent bigger. Um, and make it more, make some of the themes in the tent more unified across agency levels. Uh, my own sense is that the, uh, um, the struggle to produce the Homeland Security Agency is still so fresh in everyone's minds that there won't be an agency reorganization that goes through Congress anytime soon. And, and therefore, I think you have sort of default mechanisms popping up in the executive, like the uh, executive order on national ocean policy. Um, that 
will, that is intended to bring the various agencies that have marine interests in the different regions together, developing at least a conversation around some common interests and, and, uh, and getting to some of the uh, uh, subterranean conflicts uh, that they currently have uh, with each other uh, that are impeding uh, forward progress on ocean management. So, I, I, you know, it probably should have gone through Congress. It would have been, you know, maybe it would be more forceful if it went through Congress. But uh, the National Ocean Policy, I think, is, is exactly uh, the, the response um, to what you're raising as a legitimate issue. Time for one more. Morgan. Josh, I want to push you a little bit on your, I was expecting your conclusion to be get rid of the council. So I was a little surprised when you didn't go there. Um, Listening to everybody in the panel reminds me a little bit of a panel I listened to of oil and gas people. And it was a pretty broad range of people, but no one was willing to blow up the system. They, they knew the system, they were used to it, and I feel like I hear a little bit of that here today. Where if you were designing from scratch, you think you'd really come up with the council system? If you were designing a system to manage some other natural resource, do you think you'd come up with the council system? Do you really believe that it's the way to go? Would you recommend it in other systems? Or are you just not quite ready to blow it up? Yeah, I'm still scared of Senator Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't say it. He's watching me. Yeah. <laughs> I think I really get a little nervous even uh, talking about it. But, um, I'm, I'm going to rephrase that just for the recording. So, so the question was, uh, is there truly an appetite for gutting the council system from this natural resource management scheme? Or are we just so used to it that we don't want to touch it? Or so scared of Senator Stevens? Uh, I think my answer would be, I, you, know, I, you know, look, there, there are agencies, certainly agency managed natural resource systems have lots of issues too, okay? Um, my bigger picture answer would be, I don't think I would start with the Magnuson Act, uh, or put it, or Magnuson Stevens Act. But what I think I would start with would be, um, I guess my view is that the, the efficient resource management systems are the ones that have narrow goals as opposed to multiple use goals like uh, the Magnuson uh, Stevens Act. So what I would start with would be essentially, uh, not to go too far off track, but a, uh, a division of the ocean, much like our public lands out west, uh, into areas where essentially uh, there would be use priorities. So certain areas um, would be, uh, uh, say, commercial fishing areas where uh, there would be some uh, conservation requirements, but they wouldn't be as stringent, in other words, it would be really up to the commercial fishing industry to fend for itself, and we could afford to do that because that wouldn't apply to the entire ocean. Um, and so it would, and the agency managing that would have the goal of promoting commercial fishing. So I think doing it that way, would, rather than battling everything out and getting into these essentially what are value battles um, because of lack of fact, um, would be more efficient. So I don't know if I would start with it. I do, there are some things I like about, like I said, about the council system, if it had more uh, diversity, I think it could actually be a little better than an agency system. So this reminds me of a quote that I heard in law school, uh, that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other ones, right? Um, so thank you all for your patience. Thank you to our panelists, a uh, really esteemed group of people. We're going to take a lunch break. Lunch is available out there. It's box lunch, and there's plenty of seating options sort of out and about on the second floor, and we'll be back here at 1.30 to talk about other resource schemes. <laughs>